Hi everyone in Cloud Computing and welcome to episode 62 of the Cloud Computing Training Show featured on YouTube and podcast with Brad Nelson and internationally recognised and the world's number one cloud industry expert and thought leader, David Linthicum. This show is sponsored by Nelson Hilliard, Cloud Computing Recruitment Specialist, placing great people in cloud, IoT, fintech and AI. This week we are excited to have Dr. Kirk Bourne as our special guest. Kirk is the Principal Data Scientist and Executive Advisor at management consultancy firm Booz Allen Hamilton. Previously, Kirk was Professor of Astrophysics and Computational Science at George Mason University. Kirk has spent nearly 20 years supporting data systems activities for NASA space science missions, and since 2013, he has been listed consistently each year as a top worldwide influencer in big data and data science on social media. Hi, Kirk. It's great to have you on the training show this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Brad. I'm really glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, look, we've had great fun recording the Australia show and the C-Suite show. So it's um, I'm really looking forward to the training show. I know we've got some great things to talk about. So uh, yeah, I'm really excited about that. Really looking forward to it. Hi, Dave. Great to have you on another training show this week. Yeah, it's great to be here. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's all a bit of a blur. We've had so much fun. <laughs> it's it's all virtual. Class. So look, a warm welcome to you both. And look, in this week's show, we're talking about that as machine learning and artificial intelligence has become more pervasive, data logistics will be critical to your success. And good data logistics does more than drive efficiency. It is fundamental to lower costs now and improve agility in the future. So look, an opening question coming straight over to you then, Dave. Uh, how do you see this journey of training in AI and ML? And what do you see lacking so far? I think what's lacking is people are out there who are willing to teach it. You know, even if it's just doing videos and writing uh, things, I'm finding not a lot of great content out there and even books uh, to find kind of core guidance as to how to take this stuff to the next level. And so, you know, it used to be, um, and Kirk would probably live in this generation as well, you know, we could go down to the bookstore. I used to go to the micro center uh, in Fairfax, actually, where you live, Kirk, you know, every day after work when I was, you know, leaving Mo Loyal and, and look at magazines, and this is pre-internet, and, and, and buy some really cool books that really would be the Bible in terms of how you build databases, how you design things, things like that. And I used to you know, try to read a book a week, a couple of books a week sometimes if I, if I was really busy or not busy. And the reality is I don't think there's a lot of guidance out there. There's really no key books. Um, you know, there's a Phoenix project if you're dealing with DevOps. Um, but as far as a database manifesto, how to leverage MI technology and databases, there, there's really no one source that you would go to, which really kind of is the last word in how you do this technology. And also there's really not a lot of one people you go to uh, to understand the last word in, in the technology or typically a group of people. We have influencers and thought leaders. And you know, I always get on the list with um, you know, people in cloud and ML and AI. But the reality is there's a hundred of us. And so which one do you listen to? And we're all not saying the same thing. And by the way, you know, I'm writing blog posts now, even for your site, um, you know, that are 300 to 500 words. You know, I can't get down into the nitty gritty. You know, even the Linda videos that I do, um, they're providing intro guidance on how things are done, but a deep understanding and kind of guidance in terms of something that's going to be dynamically changing over time really doesn't exist. And I think we have to take learning to the next level. And, and, and I always, you know, think about this, I'm participating in, uh, with a university now and helping them write courses. But the thing is, it's really about the details and how you take this stuff and implement it and using it in a sentence. And by the way, mapping into real technology and people I think aren't used to seeing that they're given general guidance and a lot of stuff, times they have to figure it out themselves. You know, I found the best people who work for me, who are the quick learners, are ones that are, in essence, what I call educational private detectives, um, because they know where to find the information, because they know how to search it, where, where in the internet the key things come from, and they need to get you know, database specs from here, compliance specs and, and understanding and thought leadership from here, you know, database administration from here. And by the way, in the database world, is an object-based database, relational-based database, um, uh, special special pur uh, purpose built database, you know, me in memory database, and those are all kind of different tiers of understanding going forward. And so your ability to kind of, you know, figure out these threads through this mass amount of information is almost a career skill. It's a career maker. And people who do that to the person are typically people who understand more about this stuff than anybody else. And 
I just think we need to make it easier for people who are just trying to get educated on this stuff to find the information that they need. And if that's one book, one video series, you know, one, you know, even if it's 20 books that they can read in series, lessons, things like that, you know, let's go ahead and write it. I understand it's going to be dynamic and changing. So let's make it a living document or living video. And we're updating these things as we go. But I can't point anybody to one place uh, that they need to look to uh, to find this information. People come to me all the time. They go, you know, how do I learn about cloud, AI, ML, things like that? I'm sending them down 20 different paths for each one of those things. And by the way, those paths change every month as the things go online and things go offline. So that's what's lacking. And so we don't have the standards. We don't have the thought leadership we don't have the things that I kind of depended on yesteryear where I could go to a single source or single set of sources, you know, that provided me with consistently good information. Yeah, you know, Dave, I think it's, um, it, it's a big kind of quagmire, isn't it, of uh, where to go to learn and having that, like you say, autodidact uh, approach to, to learning and, and being able to be uh, the um, private investigator of learning. I love that phrase, actually. I really love that phrase. That was great. I can just imagine this guy with this huge magnifying glass and these Google specs on or something, uh, just trying to find what the hell he's supposed to do. But Kirk, I mean, it comes nicely over to you. What are your, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I uh, really uh, like what Dave is saying there. I mean, Dave, if, uh, if you ever teach a class, make sure I find out about it so I can come. Uh, <laughs> but I think uh, you also introduced this as uh, uh, episode 62. So I encourage people to go listen and watch the other 61 episodes prior to this, because I'm learning a lot just listening to you talk. But I certainly agree with the, the, those those concerns, and I, and I like sort of the way you said sort of put the, the, the parts together into a sentence. And I and I think of data literacy, and 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 sort of the higher or thinking skills around machine learning and AI as 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 a literacy, in that we can learn the alphabet and we can learn words, and then we can learn how to put them together in a, in a sentence, then we learn how to put them together in a paragraph, and then we learn how to put them together in a story, and I, and so the story. Uh, for me, is is really the most important thing. There's a beginning and an, and an end. There's an objective. Uh, there, there's a sort of logical flow. So it's, it's not just that I've learned letters of the alphabet or I learned how to spell words correctly or how to put words together to make a sentence. I'm, I'm really put, you know, putting it all together in, in a way that's that's got delivering value for people. And so I, so I think what people need to learn when they're learning AI and machine learning cloud or whatever these technologies are is, is to realize that there's a, those different levels at which you're learning something in the same way a child learns language. They learn how to say the words, but they don't quite know how to put them together yet and so forth. And so it's a, it, it takes time. I mean, it might, I'm not saying it's going to take people 20 years to learn this stuff because it's changing. You know, it, it's, it's not an evolution. It's a revolution in knowledge nowadays, right? I mean, li literally, I look at blogs I wrote two or three years ago and I sort of laugh at how they seem so archaic now that it was just two or three years ago. And yet when I go to the university and I look at the physics books that are being used in the physics classes, it's the exact same books I used 40 years ago. So there's quite a different pace of, of change of knowledge in the fields. And, and the one we choose to be working in is one where it's rapidly changing. And so you have to approach this from that uh, point of view that some things I'm going to learn are going to sort of like sort of, you know, so how, how to mow the grass, so to speak, how to, how to deal with individual pieces of the lawn, so to speak. But then I, the bigger picture is how do I actually landscape an entire, you know, golf course to, so that people can can have a successful game of golf, 18 holes. All. So so think of the the what you're building is, is, is sort of a, a bigger uh, enterprise than maybe your little piece of it. But so you, so you have to learn both at both levels. Where do, where do I fit into the big picture? You know, but how do I get this brush stroke right so this picture looks correct at the end? And that, that's that's the challenge. And uh, if, if you're not a person is not a lifelong learner, you know, not uh, self-taught and, and motivated to learn, then, yeah, they're going to fall behind. And, uh, and I agree. I agree with you, Dave, that if, if not the person you want to hire, if that person is not motivated to do that automatically. I mean, I, when I was at the university, the, the, the one kind of graduate student uh, that I didn't did not like to come to my office, which which fortunately was not <laughs> very often. The one who came to me and basically asked me to tell them what to do and what to read and what to do. <laughs> and I said, can't you figure that out for yourself? What what interests you? What are your passions? What do you care about? And what is it that that you know that gets you up in the morning? And that's that's where you start is like what motivates you to do what you do? And then you, you just want to go learn. 
Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a good way to look at it. I, I think going forward, uh, we do need to kind of identify a base set of things that, that people need to understand because you are going to build on those base sets of things. Um, but I think that once you get to a professional level, which is kind of what we're talking about here, um, and you have an understanding of what a CPU is and what the binary what the binary system is and you know some of the basic stuff, it really comes down to that. And everything else is really just kind of an extension of that. And I think that the expectation out there is that I'm going to, in essence, learn something that's very narrowly focused. And I'm going to focus on that until I have to learn something else. And then I'm going to go learn something else that narrowly focused. And typically people have are telling me what to do. And I, I think that, you know, that's 90% of the workforce out there right now. I think that we're in a crisis of not having uh, exp uh, people out there who are autodidacts and the ability to kind of pick things up and learn. People are learning things every day they probably shouldn't be learning and, you know, spending more time on social media and, you know, and, you know, watching Netflix and YouTube and things like that and not necessarily spending the same amount of energy on their professional career. Um, and I understand there has to be a balance. We can't, you know, go off there and spend all our time on a professional career. I think that's unhealthy into itself. But the thing is, there has to be a certain passion behind what you're doing or else you shouldn't be in the job. Um, and I've had people tell me and said, well, you know, thank you very much for that. But if I don't have a computer job, I'm not making any money. You know, I'm not going to go back to my you know, old job, you know, delivering packages or whatever. Um, and I think we're getting to the point where we have uh, those who um, are can do in other words, they're going to be learning as they go, and they're going to can-do, can-do new technology. They're going to figure things out fairly quickly. And those are typically the ones who are you know, superstars in their organizations. And then we have those who are basically going to be cruising along. And, and used to be you know, probably 60% were cruising along and 40% were the can-dos. And now I see 80%, 90% is cruising along, and then a smaller percentage is the can-dos out there. And the reality is the difference between the two is the lower half does not consider it a lifelong learner. They're, they're not passionate about what they do, and they're basically just doing enough to keep up and keep the certifications going and things like that, where those who are really kind of motivated in the space are actually le learning to make a difference. The problem is, is that we're accelerating in the market in terms of technology. It's accelerating exponentially in the last five years, and it's going to continue for some time. And so we need those top 10% to be the top 50%. And I'm not sure we're gonna get there with not only, I think the training is getting better by the way, since we're talking about training, and but just providing um, pass in terms of people, you know, getting off their butts and getting things learned and getting motivated about what they're doing. And I'm not sure, it, well, I'm not sure if it's something in the water, if it's, you know, basically the way, um, <laughs> You know, colleges have taught computer science in in the last few years, and you know things like that. It's uh, it's just seems to be a crisis, and I think we're going to find ourselves limited by not by technology, and I think this is occurring right now, not by technology, but the fact we can't find the people who are the can-do people who are able to keep up with technology and stay ahead, and I, I think that we're limiting gross national product, we're limiting the country's gross national product because of this issue, and we got to figure out some way to solve it. Well, one thing for me, I, when I uh, first started going to what I would call data science conferences, as opposed to what I used to go to in the past, which was more research, academic research conferences, which focused really on data mining, machine learning, algorithm development, so academic research as opposed to the application. What I discovered when I started going to data science conferences, data analytics conferences, if you want to call it that, was that the uh, some of the key, uh, keynote speakers and who were like chief technology officers and chief executive officers of companies, uh, these people were younger than my own children. <laughs> I mean, the the real innovative spark and the, and the passion and the energy is being driven, you know, you know by the by people who are like full of energy. I mean, I, I mean, at my age, I'm not quite so full of energy anymore. Uh, so, and I, and I respect that in myself, that I know that I'm not going to be able to, you know, burn the midnight oil like when I was in college. I, you know, I was doing physics problems 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and who needed sleep, right? But <laughs> that doesn't work so much <laughs> anymore. And so, uh, so but, the, but there, there are people who have that energy 
and we should uh, you know just sort of make sure that their voice is heard and that their opportunities are given there. And I think that's uh, that's in, in a sense that maybe we can, we can sort of pull ourselves up and along. Because uh, one thing that I also see is when, is when those people speak. I mean, there's a lot more younger people who then get motivated to join uh, join that uh, that army. You know, that 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 party of, of can doers. So I, I really like that. I mean, I like the fact that uh, you know there's more people that come when they see uh, people like themselves uh, doing these things, and it's not just the guys with the gray hairs doing these things. Yeah, I, I think. Uh... The reality is that all those people you just mentioned have jobs and, and they're going to keep, you know, they're going to stay in those jobs for as long as the people who are employing them will have them because they're probably absolutely dynamite and doing their jobs going forward. The thing is, how do we replicate, you know, this 10 to 15 percent of the can doers, you know, to, to at least 60, 70 percent? Uh, I don't believe everybody has to be. Um, you know, exceptional what they do. Some people want to show up and get a paycheck and go home and have some other passion that they're passionate about that they may not get a paycheck for. It could be gardening or working on their car or something like that. But people who get excited about the profession, I think, are getting less and less. And people who are able to learn on their own and become kind of lifelong learners are, are becoming less and less, you know, percentage wise in the business. They're out there. And by the way, we could put 10,000 people and look at the, and still be right about you know, this kind of this kind of assertion. And I think that going forward, we need to be a little bit more careful in how we teach this proactive learning, this uh, um, lifelong learning, cap- you know, at the at the high school, at the elementary school levels and, you know, get it in their hands even before they get into college. Because I think people are successful at college, to your point, are people are self-motivators, people who can get up and understand a course and understand beyond what it is and not just memorize the bits and bytes of a particular textbook and regurgitate it on a test, but the ability to kind of understand how it fits into what they're learning, how it's meaningful to what they're learning, and kind of take it to the next level. Um, and so I think there's there may be a fundamental fix that we need to make to the educational system to kind of align to this. So it's not as I'm not an educational expert, I'm not sure what to do, you know, or a child psychiatrist, or you know, figuring out how to do it. But I do know that we're entering a crisis where we don't have enough of these people who are able to kind of figure things out on their own and they're very less motivated and therefore not necessarily lifelong learners, proactive learners, autodidacts, the people we need to take things to the next level. The ones we have that are out there are exceptional, by the way, I agree with you on that. And a lot of them work with me. Um, but a lot of the ones that I'm seeing, you know, step in front of me and people from, you know, Carnegie Mellon and Harvard and Yale and, Princeton and you know all the major or universities still may have the same symptoms as that they still may not be can doers even though they got into a great great university they've just kind of gone through the motions to get a degree and someone who's really going to take your business to the next level or take technology to the next level or really kind of take what we're doing to the next level you know should be constantly challenging constantly um, looking to improve their skills and I think that's few and far between out there right now. I mean, maybe, maybe I'm just being cynical and someone's going to, uh, you know, set me straight after we publish this video. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I, I, I would go on, on uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on the record. I haven't blogged before. I'm going on the record and state that, that we're at a crisis of talent. We're a crisis, not of talent, by the way, a crisis of self-learners uh, who are not able to keep up with the technology space. They're, they're going to niche out. They're going to get into one particular thing they're able to do. And they're just going to basically ride uh, the momentum and not necessarily drive it. Well, there's a lot of thoughts there. <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, some days I feel like uh, maybe education needs to be more like a, a like a research lab. If you think of like Bell Labs or places like this where you, there's a lot of experimentation. I mean, you just think about the, the famous stories about Thomas Edison, right? He, you know, he, he tried 999, <laughs> you know, figuratively, you know, versions of the light bulb before he got it right. And, you know, people said, oh, you failed 999 times. He said, no, I learned how not to make a light bulb 999 times. And so the learning process is not about that memorization and regurgitation, as you were saying, Dave. It's really about the experiential, that is, le- learning what works and what doesn't work. And so maybe it's almost like you have to sort of like put a little bit of anarchy into the education system and let sort of people with, with guidance and, and structure and, and, and sort of, you know, knowledge modules, if you want to call it that, you know, but still let them sort of play with it. And does, does, for example, does this concept work with that concept? 
I mean, I had this knack, which I never appreciated till later in life, but I was actually successful in, in, uh, in my physics classes because I saw connections across the different courses. And then it just sort of, there's like all this reinforcement because it was like, oh, that's just another way of looking at inertia or another way of looking at um, you know, the law of thermodynamics or another way of looking at energy conservation. So it was, it was basically seeing that the connections across the boundaries of otherwise you know, disconnected things. And, and so maybe sometimes when people look at all these technologies, they just see them as disconnected things, right? And so maybe if they get, get a chance sort of to play with it and say, wow, gee, I, I see how these two things play together. Like for, for the longest time, I just sort of ignored cloud. I said, okay, cloud is just, just sort of some virtual computing environment. Isn't that cute? Okay, I'm going to go on and do my work now. Okay. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's really sort of transformed our business because basically it's rent a supercomputer, right? I mean, you can, you can basically rent as much power as you want and then just give it back you know, to the cloud service provider, right? And, and that was one of the big challenges at a university. How, how does the university provide supercomputing power to its research scientists without spending hundreds of millions or you know, tens of millions of dollars on a supercomputer that will be obsolete in five years? Well, you don't do that anymore. You can go rent five seconds or five minutes <laughs> on an environment that has literally millions of CPUs at your disposal, right? So, so it's like the world is different. And, and uh, until you start seeing those connections between all those different pieces, then, you know, maybe that, uh, you know, that, that person is not going to be of value to you. But once the, if you give them sort of that playground where they can just sort of like experiment with how, what, how are things related and connected. And I find the same thing. I, I learned the same thing when I, I started teaching at the university. And that is I taught calculus to students who hated math. I mean, they took my, my freshman intro to data science course. And they deliberately told me that a lot of the students that they hated math. I hope there's no math in this course. And I would tell them, I'm, I'll just teach you the math that you know, so don't worry. I'm not assuming you know any specific math. I'll teach you what you need to know. And I actually taught them calculus and we used calculus, but I didn't call it calculus until we were finished. And then they were just like, their eyes just went wide, like, wow, they actually learned calculus. Because they, I, I showed them the relevance and applicability of this particular type of math. And they loved it. They loved solving problems with it, doing things with it. Then I told them it was calculus, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> and so, and so now they're they're seeing the uh, sort of the connection between different things that they didn't see before. Before they were just seeing these as isolated towers of knowledge, and I'm not interested in that one. Yeah, I think it would be interesting if we kind of broke out uh, college, uh, you know, almost into trade school for technologists and things like that, because I think we are losing a lot of people who, you know, can't, you know, sit for a four-year degree, um, who actually end up going into computer-related stuff anyway, but have a hard time because they don't have a degree. I think it would be nice for anyone's like you have trade schools for electricians and carpenters and plumbers and things like that, that we had trade schools for, you know, data scientists, for uh, infrastructure engineers, network engineers, you know, that people are actually doing anyway. They're going to you know, get a Cisco certification and going to get certification with a vendor and things like that. Because I, I think it would promote the fact that we're going to get down and dirty about what you're looking to learn and leave the other things out. And they won't understand calculus. And to be honest with you, I went through calculus. I never understood it either or used it since then. Um, but the reality is, is that uh, it'll provide kind of a jumping off point where we do get these, um, you know, lost men and women who are thinking differently about how they want to jumpstart their careers and get going at 19, 20, um, you know, versus waiting for your 22 years old and, you know, get a degree and have to get an internship and hopefully, you know, somebody and, you know, get a, a job and you have to work your way up and things like that and actually figure out what you want to do. I mean, when I got out of college, um, I had a CS degree and I knew I wanted to do computers, but where I wanted to work for, what did I wanted to do, what I wanted to specialize in, things like that, those were all kind of up in the air. And then by the time you're, you know, 19, 20 years old, you, you kind of have it figured out into the path you're looking to go. And that'll give them a jump start to be a, a lifelong learner. And they'll in essence get that college education, you know, the, on their own as they, you know, kind of do this self-learning things. And, you know, it's all on demand now, as you know, and we're, we're learning, to, you know, the technology around learning is amazing. And your ability to kind of start a path that way. And I think that that may be a uh, um, key to, you know, kind of solving the issue, but I have to get a lot of people to sign off on, um, building those classes. And also employers have to be interested in hiring these people that get these technology degrees. But I do see some schools in Europe that are following this model 
uh, whether just in certainly the continuing education courses and certainly the community college courses, most of those are going to be attended by people who already have a degree. Uh, I taught community college for 10 years and uh, 90% of people in my class already had a, uh, um, a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. And they were in essence reinventing their, themselves to you know, move into computer science and we and took a computer science class. And so your ability to, in essence, kind of jumpstart that early on, you know, maybe the, the way in which we're looking at this to actually get ahead of uh, not necessarily slowing these people down before they're slow, uh, but slowing these people down, which I think we're doing, and then expecting them to speed up and they're not speeding up. Yeah, I, I know we're uh, talking a lot about the sort of disruptive education here. And, uh, and I, not only am I a lifelong learner, but I consider myself a lifelong educator. I mean, I, I was 12 years at the university, but even before that, my 20 years at NASA, I was mentoring and training people. Even at uh, Booz Allen now, I'm mentoring and training people. So I just feel myself in, in that role constantly. Uh, and so I, I, I want to respect the, you know, the whole discipline of training and education itself and, and, and not sound like I'm trying to throw it under the bus or anything like that. But, but, but one th a concept that I learned a few years ago that I'm, I'm finding is really applicable across many different disciplines besides education, and that concept was called understanding by design. And so understanding by design is very, essentially system engineering, right? You, de you derive, you, you, you see what the end product is, that the product that you want, the thing at the end. And so what, what are the requirements of that thing to function properly at the end? So from that, from that you design, you know, system level requirements and user requirements, you know, and functional requirements. You, and, and so then you build towards satisfying the, the end goal, the end product. So understanding by, by design and education, basically, I mean, what is it we want this person, the student to be, to look like, to know at the end? Then we start designing curriculum. And so, so I think what's, what's maybe the sort of the, the place where education does need a mid-course correction right now is we, we, we focus on the end goal being the degree, the diploma, right? and maybe even a grade point average. We focus on the wrong thing, right? We're, we're focusing, what we want is we want that well-rounded, well-educated, lifelong learner to be the outcome of our education system, right? I, th I think... Maybe simply put, we want the, the end product to be a lifelong learner. So everything we design and do in education should be designed to build a lifelong learner. And it's not about can you get an A in a calculus class or can you get an A in a computer science class and did you have enough English or, or social studies classes in order to get a degree? It's like, are you able to think creatively, critical thinking skills? You know, how do you how do you learn something, teaching someone how to learn something? So I think taking that sort of understanding by design concept, which is basically just nothing more than system engineering, if you want to just say it that way. And, I mean, so what, what is the end thing we want to build? And now we, did, we build to that, uh, we, we design and build, you know, to the, the, to the end goal that we're, we're seeking. And the end goal, again, is no law, is, we shouldn't think the end goal anymore is a, great, is a grade point average or a degree or a diploma. In fact, I know in some universities, I mean, I'm, you know, it's okay to fail. I mean, it's perfectly okay to fail. I mean, in fact, they encourage people to fail because that's where you're going to learn. And it's, it's not about the grade. It's not about the, that, that metric, which is the false metric, right? Because people will, you know, I, I, had a, I had a bit of that in, in, in college. I mean, I, I always crammed for the exam, so I made sure I got an A's, an A's in all my classes. Right? Uh, but, you know, I mean, fortunately, I was able to actually remember things, too, besides <laughs> the memorizing. But it's it's not it was it, it, I look back on it and I say well, it really wasn't about the fact that I could cram the night before and memorize a bunch of stuff. It, it's really how I was taught to think and learn. That was the most important thing. So Kirk, I, I couldn't agree more. What do you think, Brad? Wow, where do I start, guys? This has been an firstly thank you because this has been an epic show. It really has, and we're already about thirty minutes in. So uh, this is this goes on record as the longest training show ever. Uh, which is great. Look, I think everything you've said, uh, both of you make so much sense. I think the educational system towards the latter part of their teens, it needs to be re it needs to be shaken up somehow. There needs to be some real world dynamics thrown into their, their journey so we can identify that, that um, forever learning is part of you know going forward in, in this journey of, of that, that path they've chosen already at that point in their life of, of degree. 
And I think that what what we're missing is really some. I mean, I, we, Dave, you and I have spoken about you know Google, AWS, getting into the colleges, universities, and and influencing the the um, the brand awareness of the cloud provider at an educational point, bringing them in the transition into the professional world. So you know, brand is, is clearly cemented in the workflow environment because the training has happened at school. We get that, but I think from a, a generalistic point of view of problem solving based around what organizations are suffering a lack of now and bringing that into like actually working on a project in a safe environment where you can afford to fail but essentially you're given that space to innovate because of the young talent the fresh mindset the fresh thinking it's a real key thing because people are going to be now enthralled by the learning process because they're, they're going to understand the outcome in a business of what they're doing You've, you, you both highlighted that disconnect of education and the real world. And I think to, to come from the, uh, the, the educational world into a, a real world environment and then expect people to be self-learners all the time after that, that four, six year period, people do tend to want to know what's in it for them you know, more than they do continually wanting to learn. Sometimes, obviously not every personality is like that, admittedly. You know, you've got a lot of self-learners out there already. And, and I think the way people are being influenced culturally and from a psychological point of view, social media has got a huge amount to play in that. And I think that's something that has, it has become more prominent with the likes of Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, that sort of thing, where people are seeing outcomes of that, what they want from their life. Um, and that's not normally joined up with their educational route that they think they're on and that journey it's going to take them to. So I think there's a disconnect there where social media could influence these people, organisations could influence these people, at the right point, which is pre-drop-off point of education into the into the real world, and really cement great talent that's going to be forward-thinking, learning, understand outcomes, understanding what value that's going to give to the organisation, what value that's going to give to them as an individual, their family, their lifestyle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think it's a marry-up of all of that. And that's kind of my point on that. I don't know what you guys feel on that, Kirk? Well, I, 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 I judge this conversation uh, as, as a A++. <laughs> I, I always judge uh, by, by what new ideas race through my head when I'm having a conversation. And, and so many things you said, uh, Dave, and now Brad, uh, just have just like, it caused me just a, like an explosion of ideas in my head. And, and, I, and I think I just came up with a description, it was just DevOps for education. Okay, so, that, so it's basically an, ag an agile education environment where, where you can do that experimentation and see what works, see what doesn't work. And then and, and you and you have the, the the minimal viable product or what I like to say now the minimal lovable product. I mean you you got an accomplishment and you can build on that and you and you but you always start with that sort of you, you have the the correct goal and objective that you're aiming for. And again, I like to say again that I, th I think when we say that the objective education is the diploma or the objective of education is a certain grade point average. I think we're really not serving our students well when we when we basically say this is what it success looks like you have this thing you can hang on the wall okay because sometimes people hang the thing on the wall the diploma and they say okay i, I reached the, i reached the success point right it's all downhill from here and it's like no that 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 diploma should be a certification that you know how to learn and you will continue to learn in the years to come and, that, and it's sort of like a phd sometimes people think a phd uh, I have students who've come to me who say they want to get a PhD. What what classes do I need to get a PhD? And I said it's not about the classes. It's about developing a research mentality. How, how do you look at a problem and figure out how to do something new and different and to and, and to test it and experiment and see if it works? And, and, and so it's it's a process you're learning. It's not courses you're taking. And so I think education should be more about the process of learning than what factoids you can remember. Yeah, absolutely. Very yes, good points sir. there, Kirk. And Kirk, it's been great having you. Uh, great having you on the training show this week. It really has. We've covered some some great ground. This is a, a record for our training show, almost uh, forty minutes long. So uh, it's been it's been fantastic. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. And again, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Brad. I mean, it's just the ideas are just racing in my head. So this is like the the, the best day <laughs> this week by far, and maybe the best day this month in terms of, of new ideas and new knowledge. So thank you both. Absolutely welcome. And Dave, thank you for being part of the uh, the training show this week. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on, sir. Always a pleasure, man. So great having Kirk on.
Yeah, it's been great. Look, thoroughly enjoyed this week's show. Uh, as always, uh, you know, you can get us all on Twitter. So at Kirk D. Bourne, uh, the links will all be below as well. Uh, at David Lincoln, at Nelson underscore Hilliard. It's been an absolute pleasure having you guys on board this week. It's been, uh, you know, oh, just I'm blown away like you, Kirk. It's one of those things. You've got ideas racing. Uh, it's just fantastic. So um, it's been great. Thank you so much. So remember to like, subscribe, comment, and share these videos with your friends and with your colleagues. Uh, we really appreciate all the support on social media that you give. So keep up the good work. And uh, I'm glad you're enjoying our shows. And, and I hope you enjoy these week, uh, this week's shows with Kirk. And you can go back. We've got the Australian show, the C-Suite show, and obviously this week's training show as well. So thanks for watching. And until next week. <laughs>